My name is Talia Fox, and I am the Sustainability Manager for the Town of Arlington. Thank you for being here tonight to participate in our public educational forum on the Specialized Stretch Energy Code. It is March 1st, 2023. So we are here tonight because the Clean Energy Future Committee in Arlington and the town manager have introduced a warrant article to see if town meeting will adopt the Specialized Stretch Energy Code or the Specialized Code or as it's known, the net zero code or the municipal opt-in code, or my personal favorite, the super stretch code. <laughs> Jokes aside, here are our meeting objectives for the evening. We are going to review what the specialized code is and how that relates to our local and state climate goals. We will highlight some key components of the specialized code and how they will affect Arlington. And we will provide an opportunity to ask questions of a an extraordinary panel of experts here tonight. Here is our agenda. We will start with some background information, then have an overview of the specialized stretch energy code, and then dive into some of the key provisions and local impacts, including for large homes, passive house and multifamily projects, pre-wiring and on-site solar, and then we will have some time for questions. You will also notice that we have a pause for questions in the middle of our program. I want to state up front that we are recording this meeting. Materials and resources, that includes the slides and links to additional resources, will be available following the meeting on the Clean Energy Future Committee website. You can find that at the link here, and you can also navigate to that site from the town website. I'd like to remind everyone of some Zoom norms. We do welcome your comments and questions in the chat, but we are only going to be able to respond during our designated question and answer times. And that is because we want to ensure that everyone who is listening can hear the questions and the answers that are being provided. We will do our best to get to as many questions as we can. But if we can't respond, we will do our best to post a question and answer that addresses vaguely or generally the, the subjects of the questions that you have put forth. To ask a question during our designated question and answer times, please raise your hand using the Zoom reactions button. You can find that at your Zoom bar in the bottom. You can also type your question into the chat. If you raise your hand, we'll uh, call on you to unmute. And if you type your question into the chat, we'll elevate those questions as we um, are determining how to, how to approach questions. I'd like to remind everyone to stay curious here tonight. We are talking about building codes, which are very technical, and we're gonna do our best to keep things clear and concise. Please be mindful that there are humans on the other side of your Zoom boxes. So, so be kind to our participants and our staff and our presenters. And please remain on mute unless you've been called on to ask a question so that everybody can have a good experience here. Some brief history. So the stretch code, which is a building code that provides greater efficiency over the base code, was created in 2009. In 2010, town meeting became one of the first communities, or Arlington became one of the first communities to adopt this, the stretch code. And that was by a vote of town meeting. We did this in order partially to receive Green Communities designation. Green Communities is a state program that allows municipalities in Massachusetts to access certain grant funds for clean energy and energy efficiency activities. And through that program, the town has been able to access nearly $2 million in grants since 2010. We have continued this trend of climate action and leadership around energy efficiency. In 2018, our select board adopted a goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Greenhouse gases, as a reminder, are the pollutants that cause climate change. And in addition to local leadership, when we've run into challenges, we've advocated as a town at the state level. An example of this was in 2020 and 2021. So in 2020, town meeting in Arlington overwhelmingly adopted a bylaw amendment, which was a clean heat bylaw, to ban fossil fuels in new construction and major renovations. But because the state preempts this kind of local action, Arlington, along with other communities, filed home rule petitions for clean heat bylaws. 
In that same year, 2021, the Select Board endorsed our Net Zero Action Plan here in Arlington, which is our roadmap to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And the legislature passed an act creating a next generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy, which establishes the Department of Energy Resources as the stretch code authority. So they are responsible for updating the stretch code as well as creating a new specialized code, which is the subject of our conversation tonight. In 2022, town meeting in Arlington passed Article 73, which is a resolution for a true net zero opt-in code for cities and towns. Again, this net zero opt-in code is the same thing as the specialized code. And that resolution advocated for certain stringencies in, in that code to help us get to our net zero goals. In 2022, DOER also completed the stretch code updates and developed that specialized stretch code, and Arlington as a town participated in that process. The legislature also passed, passed another climate act, which created a fossil fuel-free demonstration project that relates to our home rule petition and to the specialized stretch code, and I'll briefly go over that in a moment. It is now 2023. The stretch code updates have already taken effect for residential buildings in Arlington because Arlington is a stretch code community and all communities that are stretch code communities automatically get brought into those updates. And as we know, there is an article before town meeting or there, there will be to adopt the specialized code. I wanna hone in on a couple of things here. First is our net zero action plan, which was endorsed by our select board in 2021. Again, this is our roadmap to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. A key strategy in that plan is electrification of our buildings. Buildings represent 62% of our greenhouse gas emissions here in Arlington. A priority measure in our NZAP is to advocate for a state net zero energy stretch code, which is again, what eventually became that specialized stretch code. And a metric of success in the NZAP is the town's adoption of the specialized stretch code. So that's all to say that, again, what we're talking about here tonight is a priority in our net zero action plan to achieve our local greenhouse gas emissions goals. I want to briefly note the relationship between the specialized code and the fossil fuel free demonstration project that I mentioned. So although several communities petitioned the legislature using those clean heat home rule petitions, the legislature did not approve them. Instead, through that 2022 Climate Act, it created a 10 municipality fossil fuel free demonstration project. And I mention this because the draft regulations for that project suggest that the specialized code or adoption of the specialized code might be a key step to participate in that project. Arlington does intend to apply for this project and meet the requirements. So to summarize, adoption of the specialized code is a, an important step potentially for participating in that project. I'd like to go over some timelines here. It is March, we held a developer forum for builders and contractors to educate them on the, the specialized code and the stretch code. We're having our public forum tonight. And then there will be a select board hearing in March at a date to be determined. And if the select board votes action, town meeting will vote on this warrant article for the specialized stretch code in April or May. Should town meeting vote to adopt the specialized code, a six month recommended by DOER phase in period will begin. And the likely date that it, for effectiveness of the specialized code in Arlington would be January 1st, 2024. And like with the stretch code, once we opt into the specialized stretch code, any future updates would be automatic. All right, I'd like to hand it over to Ellen Watts, who's going to give an overview of different provisions of the specialized stretch energy code at a high level. Thanks, Ellen. Hi, everyone. My name is Ellen Watts. I am an architect and live in the nearby town of Wellesley. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight. I'm honored to be a fellow uh, member of the American Institute of Architects, president-elect of AIA Massachusetts, and a former board member of the Boston Society of Architects. I'm speaking here tonight on my own behalf because of my experience designing net zero buildings and steady effort to advance the Massachusetts Building Energy Codes since my appointment in 2007 
to co-chair the Massachusetts Governor's Zero Net Energy Buildings Task Force. My goal is to kick off this wonderful panel by giving you in just 10 minutes what I hope will be a good foundational understanding about the new Massachusetts building energy codes. Next slide, please. We all know buildings, right? In the United States, the average person spends 90% of their time indoors. Nearly 17% of our national gross domestic product is attributable to construction and real estate. We newly understand that greenhouse gas emissions impact indoor and outdoor pollution, posing serious risks to public and planetary health. And that in the US today, 35 to 40% of greenhouse gas emissions are related to buildings. As Holly just mentioned, in towns like Arlington and also in, in the town of Wellesley where I live, it's over 60%. And in cities like Boston and New York, it's nearly 70%. So I suppose it's hardly a surprise then that building energy codes are proving key to helping us achieve emissions reductions. Unless you're a building inspector, you might be asking, what are building codes? Building codes are adopted by states based on national model codes. These model codes are issued every three years by a nonprofit in Washington, DC called the International Code Council. In physical form, the building code consists of about a thousand pages in 14 separate books as shown on this slide here on the upper right. Building energy performance is regulated by just one of these books, the International Energy Conservation Code or IECC shown lower left, in reference to a national baseline standard called ASHRAE 90.1, which is also updated every three years. Some states like Massachusetts adopt the latest IECC and ASHRAE 90.1 standard really promptly. These are shown in green on the map. The states shown in yellow and red are lagging. The states shown in gray have no state code at all. In 2009, as Talia mentioned, Massachusetts promulgated the first stretch building energy code in the United States. This above code standard has now been adopted by 299 communities or nearly 90% of the Massachusetts population, while importantly spurring changes to the national model base code. Next slide. Now let's turn to Massachusetts. Massachusetts building energy codes are designed as overlay codes. That is, they build successively to meet legally binding codes. At the bottom of the pyramid shown here, the base code incorporates Massachusetts amendments to the National Model Code, the IECC, and is automatically updated for all Massachusetts communities every three years. In the middle of the pyramid, the stretch code overlays the base code with above code provisions for both residential and commercial structures, and both new construction and renovations, including alterations, additions, and changes in use. From time to time, the stretch code is automatically updated for all stretch code communities. At the top of the pyramid, the opt-in specialized code overlays the stretch code with a few, just a few, important provisions which are stricter. Importantly, the opt-in specialized code is for new construction only and requires a vote of town meeting or city council for adoption by a specified elective effective date, as Talia mentioned, uh, recommended to be at least six months from when that vote occurs, ideally a July 1st or January 1st. At the very top of the pyramid, pyramid excuse me, is a fossil-free pilot, which is proposed to be a variation on the opt-in specialized code. It essentially eliminates mixed fuel buildings, those combusting fossil fuels for any purpose, allowing only all electric buildings, those heated and cooled with heat pumps. In Arlington, uh, as well as 13 other communities, uh, there have been uh, votes to become fossil free and currently proposed legislation would allow an increase in this number in due course. Next slide. Now statewide emissions limits are mandated by a 2008 law called the Global Warming Solutions Act. That law says as compared to a 1990 base emissions baseline, the state's legal requirements are for a 50% reduction by 2030, a 75% reduction by 2040, 
with zero net greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Some Massachusetts communities have additional and somewhat more stringent emissions reductions goals. To meet the 2030 limit, statewide building sector emissions will have to drop as much this decade as they have in the previous three decades. The opt-in specialized code will help achieve this in just seven years. So will the fossil-free pilot. As shown on the map on the right, the vast majority of Massachusetts communities, shown in light blue, have adopted the stretch code, which was recently updated as of January 1st, 2023. I don't know if you can see it, but in slightly darker blue, four communities, Watertown, Brookline, Cambridge, and Somerville, have already this year adopted the municipal opt-in specialized code with an effective date of July 1st, 2023. It's understood that 20 more communities or thereabouts are working towards votes on it soon. Next slide. The most frequently asked question is, well, what are the stricter provisions of the opt-in specialized code? In a nutshell, there are five. Free wiring, solar PV, exemplary performance for large homes, ditto for multifamily, and you get a jump on the lower HERS ratings if you opt in soon. Let's take a minute and explain this a little bit um, uh, in detail. For mixed fuel buildings, that is uh, using fossil fuel for any purpose, those buildings must provide pre-wiring for future electric conversion for anything not electric from the get-go. So space heating, water heating, electric appliances, whatever. This accelerates the clean energy transition, avoiding cost premiums to convert these buildings in the future while preserving property values. Next, mixed fuel buildings must also provide rooftop solar generation in certain specified quantities, subject to exceptions for tree shading and obstructions casting shadows and so on and so forth. There's a specified amount of 24 kilowatts for single family uh, residences, uh, another amount 0.75 watts per square foot for multifamily residential buildings, and 1.5 watts per square foot for each of the three largest floors for commercial buildings greater than 20,000 square feet. This partially offsets these buildings greater emissions due to their fossil fuel combustion. And importantly, it's a very clever way to encourage all electric buildings from the get-go while still preserving market choice. Next, large homes, dwelling units with more than 4,000 square feet of conditioned space must be zero energy certified, either HER zero or FIAS zero. Pat Hamlin's gonna talk about more of that in a minute. And these exemplary performance standards encourage large homes uh, to go all electric uh, from the get-go. Next, phased in starting in July 1st, 2024, multifamily buildings greater than 12,000 square feet must be passive house certified. It's important to note that many Massachusetts affordable housing projects have been over the last five years and are currently being developed to this standard, uh, prompted in part by continuing mass save and Department of Housing and Community Development incentives which will continue to keep the supply of affordable housing strong while the quality of these buildings goes ever up to the benefit of affordable housing residents who will benefit from not only um, beneficial health effects, but also cost savings. And lastly, for communities opting in with effective dates relatively soon, there's a chance to get a jump on when lower HERS ratings uh, come into effect. 42 for all electric buildings and 45 for mixed fuel buildings. Next slide. Very briefly, this residential chart shows in green what I've just summarized, the relatively few but important provisions contained in the opt-in specialized code as compared to the updated stretch. The first two columns on the left are building size and fuel type. Along the top, you see minimum energy efficiency, electrification, EV wiring and renewable generation. As I've explained, the opt-in specialized changes shown in green pertain only to mixed fuel buildings, which are the rows in light blue. Last slide. Similarly, this commercial chart shows in green the relatively few but important stricter provisions contained in the opt-in code. 
Again, most pertain to mixed fuel buildings shown in the light blue rows and can be summarized as requiring pre-wiring and solar PV of a specified amount to the extent of the so-called solar potential zone. The real kicker in the commercial code, which regulates multifamily residential buildings 14 stories or higher, is that after a phase-in starting July 1st, 2024, multifamily buildings greater than 12,000 square feet must be um, passive house certified or HER zero. Um, it's worth noting that shown in black as uh, required by the stretch code, not the specialized code, the stretch code, there are important new provisions such as requiring ventilation and energy recovery, airtight construction tested to a validated level of performance, uh, regulation of thermal demand, energy demand intensity or TEDI, which is the annual thermal demand of a building, not usage, but the intensity of demand. And the stretch code also requires EV charging wiring, one per 20 spaces for commercial and one per dwelling unit for residential. Now over to Patrick Hanlon. So the first challenge is to unmute, which I think I've done. I'm Pat Hanlon, I'm co-chair of uh, Sustainable Arlington. And I've been working on building electric electrification ever since the Clean Heat campaign uh, that resulted in the bylaw that Talia referred to um, uh, that resulted in the home rule petition that resulted in the demonstration project and has so has a future ahead of it. Um, I'd like to talk to you in the next few minutes about one of the key provisions of the uh, uh, of the specialized code. And that's the requirement of exemplary performance for large homes. Can you go next? Next slide. So the first thing to do is to look at the pathways to compliance that are available to houses generally. So you can see uh, the ways in which large houses ha have to be exemplary as Ellen, as, as Ellen called them. And there are three basic pathways for smaller houses. Uh, the first is all electric. And that's pretty easy, at least to understand, because you don't have to do a lot more than you have to do for the stretch code uh, itself. But what you do have to do is to be all um, is to be all electric, which, as Ellen stressed, means uh, not just heating and and hot water, but also uh, uh, appliances, heating. Uh, uh, if you have fireplaces and, and and all of that sort of thing. Basically, there can't be any on-site combustion of fossil fuels. The second uh, way of, uh, of complying is the mixed fuel pathway. Uh, and you should pay attention to this one because it's going to be a mysterious vanishing one in just a moment. Um, that requires uh, getting a Hearst rating of 42, which is what Ellen described as where the ultimate landing point is under the stretch code. But the key thing is it has to be electric ready. And that's not just a matter of pre-wiring, although that sort of is the thing that, that we mostly see it described as. Uh, as DOER calls it, the electric ready includes all of the infrastructure needed to change fossil fuel equipment, to electric with minimal impact in the future. So you have to have adequate capacity, you have to have the adequate uh, distribution methods, you have to have the space to put the equipment and so forth. The idea is basically all you need to do to electrify is to buy the electric thing that you want, whether it's a boiler or whatever, a heat pump, and you need to be able to, and you're all ready uh, to, to just plug it in. Um, the alternative way of mixed fuel is, is also similar. Passive house is sort of like hers, only much more so. And you'll hear uh, you'll hear a lot more about that in the in the next panel. Uh, it's a much stricter energy efficiency uh, standard than reaching uh, hers 45. Uh, but as you'll hear, there are a great deal of uh, there are a great deal of uh, of other benefits to it. All right, the third way of, of uh, the third pathway is zero energy. And this requires you to achieve the same energy efficiency that the mixed fuel pathway does. But then you have to provide enough renewable energy, which is probably solar, to bring you all the way down to net zero energy. So for example, if you were 
following the Hearst method of doing this, you would have to show that you comply with the 42, uh, the Hearst rating, rating of 42 that is otherwise required. And then you have to provide enough on-site renewable resources to take that all the way down to zero. If you're doing passive house, it's a similar thing in structure, um, but the, you have to follow the either, in this case, the passive FIAS, the passive house of the United States, uh, core standard, uh, and then you have to have offsetting renewables. And this is the only place actually in the specialized code where you're allowed to offset renewables with offsite rather than onsite uh, renewable energy. Next slide. So I jumped to the next slide because I know everybody is impatient, but the concluding line to the previous slide, if you have a fourth house of 4,000 condition square feet or more, you have to use either all electric or zero energy. The mixed fuel option is not available to you. So that means you either have to go all electric or you have to go net zero. Uh, and you don't have any middle choice uh, that provides you with a flat path of compliance. Now that provision, 4,000 square feet is pretty large and that provision uh, will have a significant effect uh, in Arlington. Um, it will apply to most, if not all, excuse me, many, if not most, probably most, uh, new construction of single family houses in Arlington, as we'll see in just a minute. Um, I emphasize here again that you have to go all electric means all electric. Uh, and if you don't do that, you have to go down to net zero with very strict standards. So the bottom line there is that big houses in Arlington are going to have to be more climate friendly under the specialized stretch code uh, than they have to be uh, under just the, the stretch code. Next slide. So I wanted to dwell a little bit on how we know about the uh, what the evidence is relating to the coverage of the new stretch code. And there isn't any really hard evidence that does, uses condition square footage because the town doesn't normally keep that. But it does keep uh, records having to do with either gross square footage over time or finished square footage, which is a closer uh, proxy for condition square footage. So the condition square footage on this graph is the gray line. Uh, the red, the blue bars is over certain de over uh, several de several uh, over a considerable period the amount of new construction there has been. Most of the periods are five years long, except for the to twenty to twenty two in that last, which is much is therefore much lower. But you can see that from the gray line that in the year 2000 to 2004, um, the average size finished square footage of houses in Arlington was under 3,000 square feet. And today, it at the median, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say the average, I meant to say the median. Today, the median is right around 4,000, so that if everything continued exactly the way it is today, uh, then about half of the town's uh, single family dwe dwellings uh, would be uh, would be covered by the specialized stretch code. But we also see the slope of that line and we've gone up quite a bit in the last 20 years. And everybody in Arlington knows that new houses in Arlington are not only already big, but they're getting bigger. And the bigger they get, the more important the specialized stretch code will be, uh, will be to them. Next slide. So to take a, um, to look more closely at just the last year, um, this is data from the uh, Town of Arlington Inspectional Service Department. Uh, there were 24 new dwelling units uh, that were split between single family and duplexes uh, built in Arlington in 2022. Half of those were all electric, just showing that that certainly is doable. Um, and seven of those were more than 4,000 conditioned square feet. Uh, and those seven, those seven were all single families. And there were a total of 10 single families in this mix. So basically 70% of the single family homes built in Arlington in 2022 exceeded 4,000 uh, conditioned square, square footage. So while it may not be true everywhere that this provision of the stretch code is a big deal because Arlington has big houses, it's a big deal here. Next slide. 
So at least from the point of view of people, those of us who've been advocating for a while, the large house rule and the specialized stretch code itself really is a first step. There's lots more that needs to be done in order to get to the objectives that Ellen had described earlier. Um, here, uh, we have a powerful incentive to, to, uh, uh, to under with the, the 4,000 square foot rule uh, to electrify and uh, net zero isn't bad either. Um, the rule is going to apply to more and more houses as time goes on. But obviously the next step would be to apply the same rule to smaller houses, which would over time lead to nearly universal electrification of new low density housing construction in Arlington and in other places as well. Um, that has to be for another day and uh, another town meeting. And I promise you actually that there will be another town meeting that will deal with that subject because we will have to eventually deal with the uh, with the fossil fuel pilot program that uh, we began with. So with that, golly, I guess I don't know who yep. is the next I'm, person on the you're, list. You're great. So Kaya? what we're actually going to do right now oh, it's questions is pause for questions related to any of the items that were just presented. As a reminder, you can raise your hand in the Zoom uh, raise hand function and we will uh, call on you to unmute, or you can put a question into the chat. And this will not be the only opportunity to ask questions. You can ask questions at the end of the presentations. Tali, do you wanna start with the one question you received? so far? Um, sure. I believe, so the one question I have received so far is um, whether embodied carbon is getting discussed for any of these codes now or in the near future. Um, I think I'd like to kick this actually, if Ian Finlayson from the DOER is present on the line, I would love for him to address this question. Um, if not, I can give a quick response. Ian, are you present? Uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to join. It's not often that people spend their evening listening to presentations on building codes. So. <laughs> and if you could um, actually introduce yourself, Ian, that would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm Ian Finlayson. Um, I live in Arlington uh, on Russell Terrace and I work for the DOER and actually I'm the lead on development of the stretch and specialized energy codes. Um, so I, I get to spend my day thinking about building codes as well as my evenings. Yeah. But uh, so great question about embodied carbon. So just to jump into that, we um, when we put out our straw proposal on this back in February of last year, we did have consideration of embodied carbon in there. And we got a lot of public comments, um, both for and against uh, integrating embodied carbon in the code. Um, at the end of the day, I think that the administration viewed it as a little bit early to get embodied car carbon language into code. Um, but And so it, it isn't in the stretch code or the specialized code that you have in front of you today. But I would say it's very much on our radar screen for what needs to happen next in the energy code development. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, we sort of do this on a three-year cycle. So I think we'll be looking at, at that. We've already started talking to different groups that are working on embodied carbon language. And with the amount of federal funding available, we've already applied for some funding for research on embodied carbon in codes. So uh, that process is underway. Uh, there are a lot of people around the country working on it. And um, I'd say watch this space. Thanks, Ian. Um, and we got a question to define what embodied carbon is. And I think that's a great question. Um, if you wanna also take that, Ian, if you have a quick response, that would be great. Sure, I can, I can take that one. I'm sure lots of people on this call could answer it better than I, but um, essentially the concept is that um, there's carbon in fossil fuels that that you know is very that we're very aware of because you know when we burn them the carbon dioxide is emitted, but there's also a lot of um, carbon used to in the manufacture, production, transportation 
of different materials. Um, so something like, I don't know, an iPhone or a laptop, a lot of energy and as a result, carbon went into producing the materials that went into that. When it comes to buildings, the things that tend to have a lot of embodied carbon are substances like concrete, cement, um, and uh, steel, and, and so on. So um, that's, that's what we're thinking of when we're thinking about uh, regulating or, or incentivizing less embodied carbon in new construction. Thanks, Ian. I see that we have a hand raised from Chris Loretti. Um, you can unmute to ask your question. Uh, we'll probably take uh, this question and then get to the, the great question that's in the chat a little later in the presentation. But Chris, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, okay. Sorry, can, you I'm so, that's all right. sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Um, yeah, thanks. My question is this. I think I heard someone say that this new um, specialized code would only apply to new construction. And I'm, I'm curious exactly how new construction is defined, because in my part of town, it's very rare that you see, uh, I think what most people would consider new construction, we're actually building something from the ground up. But you do see increasing a lot of gut renovation, where two families are you know, almost completely gutted, they might actually be torn down so only fractions of a couple walls are left remaining. Is that new construction or, or what exactly is new construction? That's a great question. I'm going to briefly answer and then kick this to Mike Champa, who is our Director of Inspectional Services, who is also on the line. But uh, briefly, my understanding is that that would not count as new construction, that a gut renovation would not be covered by the specialized stretch code, but rather the stretch code, which is automatic for Arlington. Mike Champa, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's correct, Talia, 100%. Um, but you know, there are uh, uh, new regulations in the stretch code updates that cover um, renovations, but it, they uh, lodge renovation even um, if, you know, it's not considered a new home if, if part of it is for me. Great. Okay, good question and thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so for the sake of time, I'd like to just move us on to the next part of our presentation and then uh, we can get to the, the questions in the chat and any other questions that come up. All right, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Aaron Gunderson to speak a bit about Passive House. But first, actually, I'm gonna summarize briefly um, the, the provisions that uh, were already raised about when passive house is required. So passive house is an option for many buildings under the stretch code as well as the specialized stretch code, but it is required uh, when multifamily buildings are constructed new that are over 12,000 square feet. Those have to be designed to the passive house standard under the specialized code. And in Arlington, approximately one to two new buildings per year would meet these requirements. And that's from data from uh, building permits that were pulled uh, from January 2018 through March 2023. So with that, I'll hand it over to Aaron. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Aaron Gunnarsson. I'm the executive director of Passive House Massachusetts. We're a, a local nonprofit organization that provides education, training, and, and other resources for Passive House and for other low energy building uh, construction methods. Uh, so you can just go on here, here to the next slide. Uh, so Passive House, um, for those wondering who are new to it, what, what it is, it's a performance-based building standard that focuses in on the reduction of energy use. Uh, so specifically focus on reducing energy demand in our buildings. Um, now, Something to kind of clarify right away is despite the name Passive House, we're talking about any building. Uh, this can be a home. It can also be an office or a school or a, a mixed use development. Any building type can be a, a Passive House. And we have examples of many of these different types already in Massachusetts, offices, schools, um, in addition to, to residential homes. So any building type can be Passive House. Um, and you can go on. We'll talk about what it actually means to, to do this. So first, the, the benefits of what Passive House achieves. So we talk a lot about energy reduction and the associated reduction in carbon emissions. 
Um, but there's lots of other benefits to, to being in, in a passive house. It's simply a, a better building in lots of ways. So in terms of financial benefits, we're reducing energy costs, so reducing utility costs. We're also seeing reduction in maintenance costs. So both in terms of the maintenance of, say, the, the uh, elect or sorry, the mechanical equipment that is used, since it tends to be smaller and used less often. But also simply there's a lot of uh, longer lasting construction methods. So the home itself will tend to need a lot less maintenance work. Um, in health and comfort benefits, we're seeing improved improvement in indoor air quality. So simply a, a better, healthier environment to be in. Uh, consistent temperatures, whether from room to room, floor to floor, you have a much more consistent and comfortable temperature level in the building. And quieter acoustic conditions as well. So blocking out noise from, from outside, for example, or having a reduction in noise from the mechanical equipment inside. Um, and then, of course, those environmental benefits, uh, so reduced carbon emissions. Um, we have a more climate resilient building, so when it's able to withstand, say, extreme uh, weather uh, pattern changes or power outages that we experience from time to time and more often these days. And there is a focus on embodied carbon. Uh, it's not part of the passive house requirements to sort of be a passive house building, but it is part of what uh, the architects and uh, and builders of these projects tend to focus on using materials that do have a lower embodied carbon content. You can go on here. Um, so this is briefly what you know, what the kind of the construction features of a passive house. So the building envelope, we have exterior thermal, uh, sorry, exterior thermal insulation, which is think of it like throwing a sweater around a building. You know, putting the sweater on you to keep the heat in in the winter. That's what we're doing. You have a continuous air barrier to kind of control where air is coming in and out of the building. Uh, reducing thermal bridges. That's a lot of different things, but you can, an example would be wood studs in your home. Wood studs conduct more heat than the insulation does. And we want to reduce the amount of those type of thermal bridges in the, in the project. Uh, better performing windows and doors and optimized solar heat gain. So we can take advantage of some of the, some of the sunlight. Um, and then we do have mechanical systems. So there's balanced ventilation, um, also efficient and minimized um, heating and cooling systems and more efficient water heating systems as well. Um, you can go on. Um, so passive house has been scaling up dramatically here in the state, and it's been scaling most dramatically in multifamily projects. So that's where we've seen the most growth in terms of passive house. This is showing you enrolled projects through the Mass Save Incentive Program. Uh, this is for uh, passive, or sorry, for multifamily projects that are five units or greater can enroll in this project if they're going to meet the passive house standard. And we have already over, sorry, over ten thousand units worth of development enrolled in, in these projects, which is enrolled in these incentives, which is pretty pretty exciting. Uh, these incentives have been out now since 2019, so we have a few years here, but it's uh, been pretty incredible to see this huge, huge growth in Passive House. You can go on. Um, and as I mentioned, with multifamily being kind of a, a huge focus of growth, we're, we're not just talking about market rate multifamily, we're also talking about affordable housing buildings. And those, those numbers of units I just showed you, about 40% of them are, are enrolled through Mass Saves low income uh, um, sort of definition. So we're seeing kind of a, a large amount of affordable projects that are choosing passive house. All the ones on your screen right now are affordable housing projects. And this is showing you sort of the cost premium for them. But the main point here is that the incremental cost, you know, to go from a traditional building to a passive house building is coming down and it's coming closer and closer to that sort of break even point where we're hoping here in the next well, a little while, we're not really going to see much of a difference in terms of cost from what a code built building is to what a passive house built building is, at least on these multifamily larger buildings. Um, and one more slide here I have, and um, you can go on. Um, so this is showing you the incentives. So this is for the multifamily incentives through MassSave. Uh, lots of great financial resources available to project teams. Uh, there are lots of other incentives out there as well. So this is just kind of one, one source of them through the MassSave program. Um, and actually one more slide you can go on, because in addition to funding the sort of projects, uh, they're also providing a lot of great training resources. So questions I get a lot are what about, you know, the contractors and trades who sort of need to get up to speed on building different types of projects. Well, we have a lot of great training resources to help out, and we've been doing a lot of work so far, even over the last few years, providing a lot of great training resources to contractors in the state. So we're helping to sort of fill, fill that need. Um, that's the end of my session here, but I'm, I'm going to stick around for questions. Thank you. 
Thanks, Erin. I'm going to have uh, Jeff Eisinger from UTL speak a bit more about Passive House in the marketplace. So, Jeff, will you take it away? Will do. Thanks a lot, Talia. Um, it's really um, it's, it's great to be at this meeting, and I'm um, happy to share some of our experiences. My name is Jeff Geisinger. I'm the Director of Sustainable Design at UTL. We are an architecture and planning practice based in Boston. We also have a small office in Providence. And Passive House has been playing a very uh, big role in our design process. Uh, and um, here on the slide, we're showing you know, some of the benefits that uh, we have encountered and that we share with, with our clients and that our clients are, uh, are finding on, on their projects. Uh, some of the things that we're observing is that uh, we're seeing more demand from clients because of these benefits. Uh, for example, on the affordable housing side, which is a big part of our multifamily practice, uh, there's a real alignment, uh, reinforcing some of the, the points that Aaron made uh, between the, the kind of um, indoor quality that you can achieve with a passive house building and the mission for many of our nonprofit affordable housing developers. And on the market rate uh, housing side, uh, there's been uh, a lot of attraction to some of the benefits related to enhanced marketability, as well as uh, the quality assurance and durability, getting a product that you uh, no performance design because of the verification that Passive House brings to the process. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please, Talia. Uh, so at our practice, multifamily housing is a big part of what we do, and Passive House is a, is becoming the, the sort of default standard for much of our uh, multifamily work, starting with a lot of affordable housing, uh, but more and more and increasingly, our market rate work is uh, utilizing Passive House to sort of set that bar. Uh, here is a a, a range of a few of the, the projects that we have that are passive house. We have six projects that have uh, gone through FIAS design uh, certification. Uh, and we have many projects that are registered with FIAS and that are in, in various uh, levels of development, including one project that we're starting uh, early in design in, in Arlington. These projects, the, the key takeaway here is that our passive house work comes in many shapes and sizes, uh, affordable and market rate, uh, low rise to mid rise and above. And uh, it has really elevated the quality of the design product that we've been able to deliver to our client partners. You can go to the next slide. Uh, I'll show just a couple of examples. Uh, this is a project in the Jamaica Plain neighborhood of Boston. It's an affordable senior housing development. And uh, a few of the things that this project, uh, it's in design. Um, it is in review right now with, with the Passive House Institute US. Uh, it puts into practice a lot of the, the kind of key principles that Aaron showed in his. Uh, presentation ranging from uh, an airtight envelope to high performance triple glazed windows and uh, good high quality continuous insulation with uh, careful attention to detailing that uh, we've been able to implement without uh, elevating costs. Uh, this is an affordable housing project. Um, many of our uh, projects like this one have uh, common uh, heating and cooling systems like that are shown here. They are right sized and they're uh, relatively small, and we're able to really maximize the area for photovoltaics. Uh, this project is going to be planning for PV. We're studying it, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to offset a good portion of the building's energy use with renewables. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, another example that I'll show is a market rate development that is uh, in construction right now in Somerville. Uh, this is the 154 Broadway project. Uh, this project uh, in part, uh, we were able to design it towards a passive house standard uh, because uh, our uh, developer partner is very interested in it, and we were able to get uh, uh, increased zoning density bonus through the Somerville zoning ordinance uh, by going for passive house. So this became a really valuable proposition for the project. And uh, one of the key features of the project, in addition to incorporating a lot of the uh, the kind of key principles that we saw in the previous project excellent envelope and systems. This project is also utilizing mass timber or cross laminated timber floor structure. Uh, so it's sort of going to be a showcase or a model for how you can really reduce that, that upfront carbon of the embodied carbon uh, for multifamily housing in Somerville and beyond. And we're hoping for this to, you know, to be a model that gets replicated uh, in other projects. Uh, this is the, the last slide I had, but I, I wanted to uh, really strike home the point that, uh, you know, Passive House is not only something that is really increasing in demand in terms of who we're working with, but it has been uh, improving our work in, work in terms of designing and building uh, better buildings. And we're excited that 
I'm, I'm excited to be here on this panel and happy to answer any questions about um, that particular standard uh, in this form. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and now we are going to have a representative from the Housing Corporation of Arlington, or on the sitting on the board of directors of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, Neil Mongold, who is going to talk about the Housing Corporation's experience with passive house construction with a project uh, that they're working on right now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Talia. Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to be here and to introduce to those of you who don't already know about the Housing Corporation of Arlington and also our interest in uh, energy efficiency and the specialized stretch energy code. Um, I've been a board member of the Housing Corporation of Arlington for 27 years. In my day job, I am an architect also. It seems like there's a lot of architects here. Um, my, I, I work for a firm called the Narrow Gate Architects in Boston, and we are a design firm that specializes in doing affordable housing. Um, we also have a contract with the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is the main primary funder of affordable housing in uh, Massachusetts. We are uh, on one of their design reviewers for their subsidy decision making for affordable housing. And um, so, and I'm also um, a member of the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is a fairly new uh, entity in Arlington is um, working to consolidate and facilitate uh, funding of affordable housing projects in Arlington. Uh, just to introduce the Housing Corp of Arlington, we are a nonprofit uh, community development corporation. We, we are not the housing authority, um, which is not a bad thing or a good thing. We're just, we are a smaller entity. We are a, a nonprofit, uh, not, not a public authority. The Housing Corp of Arlington owns 150 rental units of housing, of which 48 are um, relatively newly constructed that some of you may, if you're familiar at all with the, the Housing Corp of Arlington, we um, have just finished in 2022 the, with the project known as the Downing Square Broadway project. It's known as Downing Square Broadway because half of the project is at Downing Square in the Heights or near the Heights and half is on uh, Broadway in East Arlington. Um, there are three buildings at, uh, that are part of the Downing Square Broadway project. Uh, they were all, they were built to uh, standards of the previous stretch code. So they, um, they are, they have all electric heating, cooling and cooking. They do use gas for the domestic hot water. Um, but they are all designed to be so, so-called solar ready. So they are pre-wired and, and designed structurally to handle solar panels on the roof. And uh, the Housing Corp Arlington is currently in the process of, um, in the process of getting solar panels installed on the largest of the three of those buildings at Downing Square Broadway. Um, I just wanna say that it, it, it kind of, it goes without saying that uh, the increased energy efficiency reduces the Housing Corp of Arlington's operating costs, which helps make housing more affordable for the long term, reduces our operating costs and makes it more affordable for the, for the residents, for the tenants. Um, for the future, the Department of Housing and Community Development, the state organization, uh, they have, their standards are encouraging higher levels, ever higher levels of efficiency by awarding more points, I'll say points, in their competitive subsidy funding rounds that they offer to developers. So the state agency DHCD is really stepping up to the plate and um, encouraging developers to become, to, to work on, particularly on passive house projects. Um, also for the future, the Housing Corp of Arlington is, is planning a project on Sunnyside Street in Arlington, which uh, Jeff knows because Util is the architects for that project. Um, we're in the early stages, but um, that project will be a passive house certified project. Um, and we see that uh, most of actually most of the new projects, as, as others have mentioned, most of the new projects that are being developed as affordable housing because of DHCDs incentivizing it are, um, are going to be passive house. Um, I guess I'd say that, of course, the, the, the stretch codes have additional design and construction costs involved versus the base code. 
But as the stretch code and, and the base code, I think get closer, as well as, as builders and designers get more familiar with the standards, the difference is hopefully shrinking. And I know that Aaron showed some of those cost differences that have been researched by the Mass Clean Energy Council. Um, the, the numbers I think are getting closer. It's also getting more challenging for architects on all, all buildings because the standards are increasing. Uh, but hopefully we will get to the point where we maybe don't need to have a stretch energy code or even a specialized code because the codes will become one. I should also note that the 102 of the housing corporations units are renovations of existing housing. And I think that the impact um, of the specialized code and the stretch code is much less noticeable versus what would be known as the base code. Um, it depends on the scope of work and the size of the project, obviously. But um, just to note that about uh, two thirds of our current affordable units are were, were renovation projects and not new construction. Uh, just to kind of wrap up, I'd say, um, want to say that the Housing Corp of Arlington enthusiastically supports the move to the new stretch code and the specialized stretch energy code. We are also enthusiastically in need of the support incentives that come from Mass Save and the Mass Clean Energy Center and, um, and other programs that are designed to help offset these additional costs. Uh, it goes without saying that it's not easy to develop affordable housing in an expensive town like Arlington, but the Housing Corp of Arlington takes a lot of pride in serving our lower income residents of Arlington, and we're committed to creating the best environmentally sustainable environment that we can for the housing and for the residents uh, that we serve. Thank you. And I'm supposed to pass it on to Ryan. Sorry, I, I knew I was going to forget that. Ryan, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> take it away, Ryan. I'll pull up your slides just a second. Thanks. And while you're doing that, I'll just um, add my welcome. Good evening, everybody. Um, I guess it's fair to say we're in the home stretch of the um, presentation this evening. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Ryan Katowski. I'm the current chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee. I've been an Arlington resident coming up on 25 years now, and I actually was a, a, a founding member of Sustainable Arlington back in 1999. And it's um, it's really amazing. You know, we're, we're really on a journey together uh, in this sort of road to uh, net zero. And it's really amazing to see how far we've come. And obviously this, um, this opt-in code is an important step in that journey. Uh, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit. We, we've already heard a little bit about this from some earlier speakers, but I'm gonna come back to some of these um, uh, requirements for uh, pre-wiring and on-site solar, depending on um, whether the building is using fossil fuels or not. So next slide, please. So um, I think as we heard, if you are going to be using um, fossil fuels for any purpose in the, in the building, um, that does impose some additional requirements, uh, both the pre-wiring and uh, solar. Um, and again, this, this only applies to that mixed fuel pathway. Um, the solar, and actually, I think this, this actually relates to some degree to one of the questions in the chat. The solar does help obviously offset the impacts of that fossil fuel, fuel use on site. Um, the pre-wiring just helps make conversion to uh, electric uh, much easier down the road. And I think of that as sort of an ounce of prevention thinking that we do need to get to that net zero uh, condition in only 27 years, um, being ready and able to do that more quickly in these buildings that choose to use fossil fuels is gonna be um, very helpful. Um, and I think as Talia articulated really nicely at the beginning of the presentation, you know, these are really important strategies for us. I think it's been pointed out uh, to us before that if you look at the housing, the building stock in Arlington, we basically need to uh, decarbonize one building a day, every day, between now and 2050 to get to our goals. So there's a lot of work to do, and the, the, um, these requirements will help us get there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it's actually really challenging to summarize all the, um, the additional requirements for mixed fuel uh, buildings in one table. We tried to do that here. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But suffice it to say that if you do have mixed fuels, um, if you're a uh, low-rise residential, you're going to have requirements for uh, solar uh, production on the building. And you can see, depending on the uh, type of building, there's different requirements. Uh, 
So for a single family, it has a four kilowatt um, uh, system. That's actually a pretty small system. I have a fairly small Dutch colonial and I have a 3.9 kilowatt system that I put in back in 2011. And probably if I maxed out the roof area with the state-of-the-art panels that are available today, I'd probably get almost twice that. So it's actually a pretty modest requirement um, for, for single-family houses. Um, there are exceptions for the solar requirement, depending on shading. So we, we don't want people to feel like they need to chop down trees in order to meet these requirements. So there are uh, different ways to measure essentially the solar access to the site and provide exemptions where solar is either limited or not feasible. Um, you have similar requirements for uh, commercial buildings that are driven by the, uh, the size of the building itself. And again, with some exceptions uh, around this concept of potential solar zone, which we'll get into in a minute. But you know, in a nutshell, um, solar is required with some exceptions uh, depending on the, the conditions of the, of the site. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, there is a definition for potential solar zone area in the code, and it is uh, it is defined around um, what uh, essentially percentage of the potential solar shining on the building is relative to uh, the, the maximum relative to what you're actually getting, and then it also makes uh, accommodations for structures on the roof, so you don't if you have shading from vents or a rooftop equipment, it factors all that into calculating what the size of that solar zone is, and then it uses that to make a determination as to um, what the requirements are for the building. Next slide, please. Uh, Pre-wiring, a more straightforward, arguably. Uh, this means a couple of things. Uh, it means that you have to have sufficient capacity coming into the, to the building in terms of uh, the amperage. Uh, that means that you have to basically, when you when you design the building, you have to do the calculations for the electric service as if it were an all electric building. Um, you need to have circuits um, fed to the areas where the uh, where the equipment is going to be, and you need to have plugs as well. So nothing is ever quite plug and play when you're replacing HVAC equipment, but the goal here is to make that switch over to electric uh, as easy as possible um, under the you know, expectation that even buildings that would choose to put in fossil fuels today are going to electrify between now and 2050. And just anecdotally, I think there's there's plenty of evidence to support uh, that, you know, for a, for a typical home, a 200 amp service is likely sufficient, but obviously the 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 exact requirement is gonna depend on the, the size of the building and, um, and the anticipated uses. I think that's all I had, Talia. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so before we dive into questions here, uh, I'd like to ask Ellen just to quickly summarize at a high level uh, the things that we just covered. So I'm going to pan back to that top five slide, and then we'll address a couple frequently asked questions, and then we'll take questions from participants. So if you just give me a moment to pan back to that overview slide. Sorry for the wheel here. Okay. Ellen, would you mind giving that high level Not summary of what exactly is the difference between the specialized or the sorry, the difference between the stretch code, which is automatic for Arlington, and the specialized stretch code, which is what town meeting is deciding on? Right. There are stricter provisions, five of them. Pre-wiring, solar PV, exemplary performance for large homes, exemplary performance for multifamily, and if you pass it soon, a jump on those lower HERS ratings, which are delivered for all communities uh, at the same time if you opt in later. And can you explain what a HERS rating is very briefly? Yes, although it's it's a uh, home energy rating system, the lower the value, the better the energy performance. Um, there are certified HERS raters who give it to you as part of your building permit process. Thanks, Helen. I'm going to go to our frequently asked questions slide real quick here, and then we'll dive into some questions from participants. 
I just want to say, as always, I learned so much from the panelists and the participants in the questioning from these sessions. And I have two last messages that Talia asked me to share. Number one, if you have any questions whatsoever on your mind, you are not alone. <laughs> and many of them have been asked and answered before. Um, and secondly, there are a lot of resources to help us all gain in our, not just conversancy about these codes, but in our implementation of them. And that's where the rubber really uh, meets the road. So the five most frequently asked questions I personally get are these five. Just quickly to summarize, does the opt-in specialized code apply to existing structures? I think we've already said, and you've already heard, no. It applies to new construction. Existing structures, depending upon their size, are regulated by either the updated stretch code or the base code. Secondly, I couldn't say it any better than Neil did. Will the opt-in specialized code discourage the creation of affordable housing? No. In fact, the incentives by MassSave um, and uh, the housing um, uh, the housing incentives from, is it community development? Community development, Neil? Sorry, I couldn't get my unmute. It's a uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD at the state, which, which administers a lot of the uh, subsidies that provide for affordable housing. Thank you. They're, they're not only spurring um, better performance, but even to the positive house level. And as we've said, importantly, um, these benefits uh, really improve the quality of affordable housing, which accrues to the residents, which is all important for them to not only improve health, um, save costs over time, but to live in comfortable housing. Next, an awful lot of people want to know, can I still install a gas cooktop? You know, whether I'm a Chinese chef or a, a homeowner that just loves gas cooktops. Absolutely, yes. It's permitted under mixed fuel pathways. And we've talked about what that uh, constitutes. It requires the pre-wiring and the solar, um, essentially. Another question, a little more existential, why adopt this? There's so few changes. Yes, but the changes are important as I hope we have conveyed. I would say the number one reason is, it, is that it requires free wiring, avoiding really costly and time consuming retrofits down the road. Um, this will expedite our transition to electrification um, and also preserve property values. I also think it's highly probable that those in first, as was true of the original stretch code, will benefit from uh, prioritized training uh, and incentives. And lastly, why does the opt-in specialized code permit fossil fuels? Why do we have to go through a pilot project and a fossil-free demonstration in order to get to that level of clarity about where we need to go in the future? I would say this. Uh, it preserves market choice at a time when utility pricing is highly volatile. And a few of us studying this matter in some detail have recently found that among Massachusetts communities today, utility costs vary 300%. So that means for some communities, uh, the conversion is a no brainer. For others, it may be still uh, a short ways off. Um, and I would also say that if anybody feels uh, that net zero uh, mandates uh, absolutely preclude uh, fossil fuels. That's not true. The Federal Department of Energy has compiled all the definitions that have been used over a decade throughout the United States, and they vary widely, and very few, if any, preclude uh, any particular fuel type. So last slide. These questions and many, many more you can find in a document that the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships has put out in a frequently asked questions uh, uh, PDF. They also offer some comparative tables as shown on the right. Uh, there's also a wonderful link on this slide to the Boston Society for Architecture uh, Critical Stretch Code Series. Uh, this first one, which is linked, has a really great robust Q&A with Ian Finlayson from DOER. Uh, I'd also just comment that if you're just stepping into this, the DOER summary documents, which are on the DOER website, are much easier to read than the codes themselves. And AIA Massachusetts, among many others, are urging DOER to quickly compile or consolidate all the additions 
uh, deletions and substitutions so that we can read it in plain language, which I think will really ease implementation. And lastly, the community presentations that I've seen and attended uh, have been so impressive, are rich with information. I'm a little biased, but I think the Town of Wellesley presentation by Mary Beth Martello, uh, Director of Sustainability, who I believe is on this call, is outstanding. There are many others occurring daily as this recording will be available, so are they. Go looking. I think it's a great way to know how to uh, talk with town meeting members uh, and other members of the community who have interest and concern about these codes. Thank you, Ellen. All right, let's get to some questions. I already see we have a couple in the chat. Um, yeah, Talia, we did have a question earlier, um, if I can just read that off. Um, so there was a question kind of about um, how much electrification really matters. So it was about, um, doesn't electrification only reduce emissions if the electricity comes from renewable sources? So rooftop solar helps, but without better battery technology to last over battery technology to last overnight, much of the electricity will still come from natural gas burning power plants, right? So I guess what I read that as is the underlying question is like, why is it why is electrification important if electric is still coming from fossil fuel sources? A good question. And I'm actually going to ask Ryan Katowski, who's the chair of the Clean Energy Future Committee, to answer this one. Thanks, Talia. And it is a great question. It's important to understand um, uh, the implications of electrification. So the short answer is uh, that emissions do go down even if the electricity is produced from natural gas. And the key technology to making all this work is the heat pump, right? So heat pumps can be used for heating. They can be for heating space. Uh, they can be used for heating water and they can use in your clothes dryer. So the heat pump is so efficient that even if you were burning 100% natural gas to generate your electricity, um, when you sort of watch, sort of fo follow that energy from th the steps it takes along the chain till its end use, uh, if you compared uh, its use in a heat pump, say for heating your home to uh, even a high efficiency furnace uh, using natural gas, you're still better off um, with the electric heat pump option. And it's just because it is, it's just much more efficient at getting heat into the space than, uh, than a traditional heating system. Um, with that said, our grid on an annual basis, I believe in New England, uses about 40% of our electricity comes from natural gas. The rest comes uh, primarily from carbon-free sources that includes nuclear power, it includes hydro, um, large and small, and a growing share of other types of renewables, wind and solar primarily, as the requirements for that increase. So um, it's it's really, um, it's pretty clear that um, the electricity uh, pathway with heat pumps is, is better than dirt of natural gas. And obviously as each year goes by, it's only going to get better. If you have solar on your home, that's part of the question. Um, you know, you're not generating electricity at night, but it's a very good chance that on on on, on many days you're actually um, you're actually producing more electricity than you need to use. So that electricity is actually going out of your you know onto the wires and into neighboring homes, uh, offsetting their emissions. So um, you know, overall, uh, things are just going to get better each year if we electrify. Uh, in Arlington, we also have already a much higher renewable energy content in the electricity that we uh, that we use because of our um, our Arlington Clean Electricity Program, which most residents are uh, are enrolled in. And I think in the latest procurement, tell you, you can correct me, we're, we're actually getting 30% more uh, electricity, thank you, thumbs up, than what is required by the state renewable portfolio standard, or clean energy standard. So we're actually, uh, our electricity in Arlington is really quite low carbon to begin with. That's probably a much longer answer than was needed, but um, it is an important question to understand. Thanks, Ryan. I thought that was a fantastic uh, response. And uh, not seeing any hands raised, there are some more questions in the chat here. So we have a question about if the town adopts the specialized stretch code, will the specialized code apply to new 40B projects? 
It's a good question. My understanding is that any multifamily project over 12,000 square feet under the specialized stretch code would be required to meet the passive house requirements. And Kelly, maybe you can say more about what, what 40B is and, and when that applies. Sure, and actually, I would I would want to look into this a little bit more because 40B does sort of preclude the town from applying certain local standards above state standards. So that's just one thing I would want to check into before I gave a definitive answer. Um, I, I think it's a good question. Um, so so how about we um, put that on a sticky and make sure we get to that tomorrow? If that's all right. Okay. Yes, I'd rather give a, a clearer answer. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Ian Finlayson. Oh, you might have an answer to this, actually. Well, actually well, I'm sorry. I, I was just wanted to add, uh, there was a, a comment in the chat about the energy mix, and I just wanted to add something to that, but maybe I'll just hang on to that for a minute. Yeah, I just thought I could chime in on the 40B question. Great. Um, so because you'd be adopting a, a statewide code option, in the specialized code, it would apply to 40B. It's not treated as, say, a special permit might be as a, as a local option. OK, I think DOER is the authority here. So thanks, <laughs> Ian. And uh, Ryan, feel free to, to add. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I appreciate um, Michael Quinn posted a link to the, uh, the regional grid operator, which shows the energy mix. Um, and he's right that the 52% represents, uh, which is the gas um, contribution in the New England mix. But I don't, and this is where like, I love to hear from other people because it's not always, things are not always um, perfectly clear. I think that ex excludes the, what's in that category called net flows over external ties. Um, that's really what was generated in the region. And um, we get about 15% of our electricity um, imported mostly from Quebec. Um, and almost all of that is hydropower. So when you factor that into the mix, it lowers the percentage of uh, the mix that is actually coming from, uh, from natural gas. I'm, I, I won't say I'm a thousand percent sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's the case. Um, and it's not clear from the ISO New England website um, you know what what the composition of that in, those net imports is, but I believe it's it's primarily hydropower. I think Ryan, I think it's uh, there's there's a difference between what's generated in Massachusetts versus what's used in Massachusetts. I think that's kind of getting at the same issue that you're talking about. Yeah, and these these statistics apply to the six state New England region because this is the regional grid operator and. That's the way to think about our electricity mix. It really doesn't matter from our, it really doesn't matter if something is generated in Massachusetts or Maine um, because we we all share the same um, wholesale market um, uh, in in the six in the six states up here in the northeast. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I I don't believe there are any more in the chat that that have come up. Um, you're welcome to to raise your hand in in Zoom, and can call on you to unmute if you have a question to ask. I see Susan Stamps has a question. Susan, hi everybody. This is an amazing. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I am. I feel like I'm the the most lay person is lay person on this um, this call. And um, so I think of it in terms of how am I going to present this to people around town and in my precinct as a town meeting member because I volunteered to be the person, the point person for this code. Um, I'm very, very unprepared to do that. So it's gonna require a lot of study, um, but already the question, the the question that I'm getting most often is, am I going to be able to open my windows? <laughs> and I don't know what the answer is. So I'm just wondering if those kinds of simple-minded questions are, you know, sometimes what one needs answers for. 
Not a simple-minded question. Thank you for that question. And I wonder if one of our architects who is familiar with these kinds of highly efficient buildings can speak to this, perhaps Jeff or even Neil or, or Ian. But yeah, Jeff, I see you've unmuted. Sure. So thanks. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, to answer that question. And, and it is a good question. And it, it definitely comes up when presenting the, you know, these highly technical standards. Um, absolutely, you can open your windows. Um, and uh, yeah, the, a passive uh, envelope when referencing air tightness. It refers to you know high quality construction so that we don't have unintended uh, infiltration of air that could bring in not only you know cold drafts but also potential contaminants. Um, so we're making sure that you know when windows are closed that we have excellent air quality because we're delivering mechanical uh, ventilation which brings fresh air that's filtered, uh, that's recovering uh, waste heat, uh, and doing providing really high quality uh, breathing air efficiently. But absolutely when the when the weather is really nice outside, you can certainly open your windows. Uh, and um, you know, as a designer in our practice, we make sure that uh, we maintain that really important connection to the exterior in all of our designs, uh, so that you know there is not only a high performing technically uh, building, but also one that uh, provides that really strong connection to the outdoors. Well, that's great news. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks, Susan, for your question. I'll also note that um, I'm happy to uh, speak with you about how to talk about this code um, with others. There's definitely some, some ways to summarize at a very high level what the key provisions are, including, you know, just that simple slide that Ellen had with the five, you know, the top five things that we can make sure to define all the terms on, on there. And, and I'm happy to support you in doing that. Um, well, I think that Sustainable Arlington and Pat knows um, it is actually organizing, trying mm -hmm. to get at least one person per precinct per, per precinct to be the person who can explain to everybody what it is. Um, so maybe, uh, yeah, maybe if you could just have a small group meeting of the those precinct representatives, that would be wonderful. Great. Um, and as Anne is noting in the chat, there will be some frequently asked questions, documents, and resources available as well. Good. Um, I see that uh, Roderick has a hand raised. Uh, hi, um, Rod Holland, Precinct 7 town meeting member. And um, so somebody who is enjoying his first winter with a heat pump. Um, uh, what I wanted to comment on was the um, emphasis that was put on pre-wiring. Uh, the, it, we went through, you know, a fairly standard, um, conversion process for heat, heat pumps in, in two units of a, a two family house and the long pole of the tent in the whole process was upgrading the electrical service. It was expensive. It was slow. So getting getting that done ahead sounds like nothing but in fact it's a very significant something but that's all i've got thank you for that comment pat i see you have a hand raised do you have a, a question or were you adding to the response for for a question I wanted to add a little bit to the response to Chris Loretti's question of about 20 minutes ago. Um, it's true that the... Can you repeat the, what the question was, Pat, just for the, the benefit question, of... I'm sorry. The question okay. the question had to do with whether or not this applied to cut renovations. Uh, and the answer, as Ian pointed out, is that it doesn't. Um, I did want to say that if you looked at the pyramid at, that we had at the very beginning of the slides. Uh, the very top had to do with the pilot project. And I wanted to stress that the bylaw that we passed uh, in 2020 uh, did cover significant renovations, um, mostly very similar to what in the building code is thought of as level three alterations. Uh, and every town that has adopted a similar or similar bylaw or ordinance has got the same sort of thing because it's true of many places that uh, renovations uh, are a major part of what new construction is. 
new construction is. Um, so th this th this is a step that doesn't include that, um, but certainly it's already in train to expand uh, what is what is going to happen there. Uh, I think that it's it's clear that practically that all of the ten towns that are currently uh, have priority status for uh, the the demonstration project uh, are cl very clear that they want to include uh, uh, reconstructions and re significant renovations there. And the same thing is true in the recommended uh, draft language that was recently published as draft um, for uh, what what the DOER is looking looking at in terms of recommending uh, a, a new bylaw that would uh, that would be presumptively uh, appropriate for the demonstration project. So this is one step, uh, as Ellen pointed out, and it's a significant step, but it's not the last step. And Tom Meeting will be taking up uh, the uh, will be <clears throat> excuse me in the fall will be taking up uh, the demonstration project and. Uh, renovations will be front and center then. Thanks, Pat. And I just want to emphasize again that the specialized stretch code does not apply to renovations. It applies to new construction, to Pat's point. Um, Neil, do you have a, a comment on something? And then I just want to make sure that there are no more questions because we only have a few more minutes left here. Yeah, I'll just, uh, just a quick thing, if it, just to get into Ian's ear and maybe Ellen's ear. Um, as an architect, I wonder if there's any way that we could rename these um, these codes that to not to not say update. So uh, stretch code update or base code update because it's a it's a constantly moving target. It's kind of like if you have a file on your desk that says latest or most recent, um, and it's just it's it's really challenging as architects and builders and so on to keep up to date. And when you see something that says the update, I think, well, it just, it was just updated. And is this the new update or the old update? So that's kind of a, that's maybe inside baseball uh, comment, but uh, it's really challenging. And I would, I would think you might think about calling it version one or edition two or something like that rather than update. So thanks. Thanks, Neil. Um, and I see that Wendy has a question in the chat, which I think is a really great question, which is what will be required for new construction under 4,000 square feet? And does this encourage development of new construction to stay under 4,000 square feet? Now, there's a few answers here, and I'm going to try it. And, and Ian, you can correct me if I get it wrong here. But if the, the building is under 4,000 square feet, then it is not, it, it is, if it goes all electric, then there are no additional requirements, and it goes mixed fuel, then if it goes mixed fuel, then it has to do solar and pre-wire. So that sort of keeps with, with what we've been, this mantra we've been saying, which is if you put in mixed fuels in your building, you have to pre-wire for future electrification and add solar in the building. But if you go all electric for the most part, there aren't any additional requirements over the stretch code, which is already automatic for Arlington. Did I get that right, Ian? Yeah, I mean, it, maybe you, you did get it right. Um, I'd say an alternative and maybe simpler way of saying it is that if it's under 4,000 square feet, then if you have a solar accessible roof, it's a four kilowatt system. And if you're over 4,000 square feet and you have a solar accessible system, then it's a much bigger solar system because you're trying to get to per zero or, or the past five zero function. So, those bigger houses, which are going to be more expensive properties, are being asked to put a larger solar system on them. That's basically the difference. Right, if they're over 4,000 square feet. Um, and then the second part of this question, does this encourage development of new construction to stay under 4,000 square feet? I, I, I think the answer here is that, and maybe Mike Champa can chime in here, um, is that it, it doesn't necessarily unless you think about the mixed fuel pathway here. So if, if, you're, if you're going to do a, a construction that is 
is mixed fuel and it's over 4,000 square feet, you're gonna have lots of additional requirements that, that zero energy or the, the all electric pathway. So in that sense, um, you could say that it does encourage that less than 4,000 square foot construction because there aren't going to be additional requirements imposed. Um, Mike, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's a no. Okay, you're I, great. <laughs> and uh, we can uh, share the slides because Ellen is reminding me that that our slides also um, share some more information about that. But I see that we're at eight thirty, and I want to be mindful of everybody's time here. So I don't see any other questions. Um, I just want to thank all of our extraordinary panelists for taking the time to join us tonight and thank you all for your participation and your great questions um, again we are recording this we will post the recording in the slides on the clean energy future committee website which you can navigate to from the town website and and i believe that link was put in the chat as well thanks again um, have a great night everyone <laughs>